DC was everything. That's Chocolate DC. City. That's Chocolate City. So here it is. Here go the reinforcement again of just blackness. All I saw was black people. Quality. Owning everything, doing everything. That's all I saw. My mayor was black. My council member was black. My teachers was black. My neighborhood was black. My stores was black. The people I used to buy stuff from, the crabs or what on the side of the street were black. That's all I knew. That's all I knew. So I seen all that. I was like, oh, this is, this is the life. All right, so let's get to it. Um, we're, we're rolling right now. We have a good brother, Musadiq Muhammad. Um, this is a good brother, an amazing entrepreneur, leader in his community in Overtown, Miami, South Florida overall. Um, I want to get right into it, my brother, man. Welcome. Thank you, sir. It's going to get fun, man. I, I believe your story is going to impact a lot. Um, so let's get to it. Born and raised where? Born in a place called Centralia, Illinois, which is Southern Illinois. Where the heck is that? Exactly. Southern Illinois is probably, Centralia is probably. Come closer uh, to the mic for me, for, brother. Centralia is probably 40, 50 miles from St. Louis. Mm. Right? Uh, up until I was about four and five, I was in Chicago. Okay. Five, fam- so meaning four and five, you guys moved to Chicago or? Well, Southern Illinois is it's, it's a smaller town, but everyone goes to the big city, of course. which is which is Chicago. Um, Mom and dad. Okay, well, I, I gotta give you the interesting background on that. My father is Bahamian descent from Miami. By the way, the Bahamas. Um, my father at fourteen. Tried to kill my grandmother's then husband because he used to fight. He used to beat on my grandmother. So my father tried to kill him. His father, his father killed a man in Overtown for the mob and they moved him to Chicago. So it was mob affiliated. So when my father tried to kill his stepfather, my grandmother sent my father to Chicago where he met my mother. So the start was already. It's in my DNA. <laughs> so from this, <laughs> from, from that start alone. <laughs> so I guess that's when your mother and your father met or they. Yes. In high school, in high school. And you know, from that, from that conception came me. How old wait? How old was your father when he tried to murder? 14. Oh, he wasn't having it early. At all. If you hit my grandmother again, I'm going to kill you. Came in. My father had a little rusty 22. And bust all five shots at him. And told him, if I see you, I'm going to kill you. And my grandmother, you know, and we know his situations. My grandmother said, you got to go live with your father. Because my father was going to do it to him. Seriously. So my father... My father went with his father in Chicago where he met my mother because my mother was in high school in Chicago. How does that lifestyle going right into that? So that means your father wasn't, I don't know. Give me a story of your father growing up in Chicago. My father was an All-American, football and basketball, lettered in everything. Like um, his last year of... um, High school, lettered and everything. And at that time, I believe that was when the war came up. And um, he went to he went to Nam. And I think um, from Nam, or on his way to Nam, well, I was born in 66. So I was born in 66. So I think my father, my mother was pregnant a se- his senior year. And so my father joined the military. Went to the military, 
I was, you know, I was born conceived because I think my mother's a year or two older than my father. Uh, I was born and my father came back and my father brought me to Miami as a baby, which for my grandmother. Then my mother moved down here for I think maybe a year or two. Then she went back to Illinois. Damn, let me tell you this story. This is going to blow your mind too. So my mother stayed down here a couple of years. I was born in 66. So by the time I was four and my, mother, my father was in the military, by the time I was four, my mother went back to Chicago. My father got out the military and then my father caught a murder charge in 70. And my father got a life sentence. That changed everything? For who? I mean, For the family. I mean, not, I mean, you know, me being young, I don't know if it changed everything. Like, like I don't have a sad story. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, in life, man, we, we deal with the cards that we dealt so I didn't know anything about that. But at the time, my mother goes back to um, Illinois. My grandmother would say, nah, leave, leave, my, leave my grandchild here. So I was here from five to seven or eight. So in Miami. In, in Miami. Miami. Right? Oh. My mother came and got me second grade. Took me back to Illinois, where I stayed second grade, third, fourth, fifth grade. Then she moved me to D.C., and that's why I was. And, I, and yeah, uh, you know, I. So, I, how I, was that b growing up? Now, you said a, that's a great point. So, you don't have any sad story. So, did what there wasn't any missing out on dad? Of course. Or? I tell people all the time, and my father was locked up 27 years of my life, but he raised me through the pen and the paper. And I love him for it. You know, people always talk about, I love you, mom. I love my father tremendously. What do you think he gave you in that process? My father gave me game. He gave me insight. And he gave me, you know, the ability, regardless of his circumstances, the situation, he gave me fatherhood. I am the man that I am today because of my mother and father. But my father gave me so much game. You understand me? And my father was such a feared man, believe it or not. And I tell you this right here. My father was such a feared man on the streets that everybody loved his son. So I grew up, like, in Miami. Uh, almost like a, uh, 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 in a shelter of protection because all the gangsters knew there was one real gangster who was my father. And they paid homage and respect to him to watch out for me. Now, I will tell you this. This is a real story that, you know, I think when, when I think Jay said, I don't know how he said it, if, if I would have been around doctors and lawyers, that's what I would have been. Fortunately, not unfortunately, I was around hustlers my whole life. And that's probably why I've never had a job. So what do you think the identity of your father, what, what, like, what did he leave for you with the, with the, uh, the identity that he had mm -hmm. growing up, mm -hmm. that protection he brought you? Like, give me some of the, the I, like, give me, I want a little bit more of what, like, what that meant and what, what did he give you? You know, my father gave me, my father, Sorry. Um, you know, it's, I believe he gave me the ability to see and understand the streets. And I don't mean in a bad way, but what I mean is that, you know, when we look at the black migration and we look at black lives, right? We saw entrepreneurship whether that was having our own grocery stores, our own drug stores, our own lawn service, right? And even the hustlers who was hustling, we was young, we didn't know them, but we saw these guys doing certain things, whether it was cars, whether it was clothes, whether it's whatever. I grew up around these people. This is who I became comfortable with. Like I've always seen free black men and women. I didn't, I didn't understand at a young age, maybe the moral aspect of it, of what's right and what's wrong, I saw the ability and the adapting to survive. Mm. And I respected that. You understand me? So for me, being amongst those as young as like, I remember, I remember as a young boy, I hung at the pool hall and I used to run to the stores for the older cats who was gambling. 
So I love that. You understand me? I wasn't so enthralled with the, the flashness of it. I just knew if I work, if they like me, if I listen and I ain't talk too much, then I'm going to get some game. And that's what it was. So the value of that was just getting the game. Getting the game. Or just being free. Being free. Of course, I didn't understand bills at, at, at a young age. I just saw these dudes willing and dealing, these women willing and dealing. You was with your grandmother then? Of course I was with my grandmother. So how did your grandmother accept you running around like that? Was that normal? For I think, you know, you know, I think about this at, at a time. You remember, like, listen, I was catching a school bus at seven, eight years old in the city. There was no, there was no, it probably was, there was no pedophilia. There was no kidnapping. There was no lewd and lascivious things going on in the neighborhood. You understand me? So I was able to observe. I was able to walk freely amongst and, and see things, right? And I had a discernment of saying, I don't want that. I don't want that. You understand me? Like I tell people all the time, like I don't, you know, I don't drink and I smoke cigars now. And that's only because I'm going to open up a cigar bar, right? But I remember hitting my first joint eight years old. And I ain't never smoked no weed since then. Why not? Because I saw the effects of it at a young age. Like I saw they gave, I, I, I'll never forget, they gave me, I'm hitting the joint because I, you know, I, I want to look at the big boys. You want to be cool? Yeah, I want to be cool. I'm hitting the joint. Like, damn, this ain't for me. Right? I remember my, my first beer wasn't until I was 17, 18 years old because I came out the park. Then Miami came off the park playing basketball and I was thirsty. The coldest thing that was in the refrigerator in the freezer was a Miller's beer, which my grandma would drink. That was the first time I had a beer. I've never drank nothing but champagne, beer, and Hennessy. And I only did that for two years. I'm 56 going on 57 and I ain't drank nothing since. I was 22 years old. So my, 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 my experience with, you know, when we talk about alcohol or drugs, it was such at an early age, even then I knew this is not what I want to do. 17, 18 is when I really started understanding the fundamentals of life of how to get money and how to survive. And then I saw the adverse effect, uh, effect of drugs and alcohol, right? That, that can't be me. So I never indulged in it at all. So uh, I want to go still stay in that same growing up. Your mom was in Chicago. Chicago, still. correct. How was well, that no, it was, in, it, you got to remember from the time I was nine until 17, I was in D.C. My mother moved to D.C. How was that for you? D.C. was everything. I That's Chocolate DC. City. That's Chocolate City. So here it is. Here go the reinforcement again of just blackness. All I saw was black people. Quality. Owning everything. Doing everything. That's all I saw. My mayor was black. My council member was black. My teachers was black. My neighborhood was black. My stores was black. The people I used to buy stuff from, the crabs or whatever on the side of the street were black. That's all I knew. That's all I knew. So I seen all that. I was like, oh, this is, this is the life. But you always saw ownership. Always. Always. Like, I, I don't, you know, when you talk about a job, man, I could, you know, I think I had a job for, I used to work at this place called Jartran when I came to Miami in 84. I think I worked there for six months, maybe. You gave it a shot? Of course. I'm in college at Dade South. And, um, my father's girlfriend at the time said, yo, you, you got to work. You got to get some money, right? So I went to Jartran. You know, what kind of truck you want? 12 foot, 15 foot, 22 foot, going cross country. I'm looking at this square. I'm looking at this square shit. I'm like, y'all telling me what to do with this little bit of money? You go give me some paper. But I want, you just sound satisfied. Your father was in prison for 27 years. You just said he had a girlfriend. Of course. My father was a cold player. So your father's girlfriend was around you in the upbringing while he was still locked up in prison. Man, yeah, man, my father, man, my father was, man, my father was a hell of a dude. And I know people think that about their father, but the reality, my father was a real hell of a dude. Because my father got locked up in 70, came out in 82 for a year and a half and went back and did another 11 years. Got out and did another seven.
Just like that. So he did he ever stay longer than two years out of prison? I can't remember. Wow. But he still had an effect in your life. Please. To this day. To this day. I listen, I am him ten times just a little smarter. Mm. You know? And my son is me a thousand times smarter. Mm, I don't I'm, I can't wait to get to that part of your children because I gotta be epic. Um so growing up in Miami and the and DC. And, Miami and DC. Right, because my winters, my winters and my spring breaks and summers were always in Miami. Because That's my grandfather and your grandmother. Because my grandmother made it a point that I go see my father every weekend in Rayford Penitentiary. That was her son. That's her son, her first pain. Mm. Every summer, every uh winter. Every school break from the time I was eight, nine years old was in South Florida, Miami, because my grandmother made sure we was driving to Rayford to go see my father and my great grandmother every, uh, every week. One week my grandmother would go, next week her mother would go, which was my great grandmother. The next week the older sister would take me. The priority was take, take her, his son. To go see his father. Did you have other brothers and sisters? I got one other brother. Around the same age? Around the same? Around the same age. His relationship is not as close as mine's. Um, but we are actually four months apart. What makes a difference? Difference in what? In first relationships. Um, his mother, <laughs> you know, his mother was mad at my mother and took him to the West Coast and try to be like, nah, I, I ain't got nothing to do with him. Separates. Yeah. Do you believe, how was your relationship with, like, it saw your relationship with your father was the foundation that built the man you are today. How was the relationship with your mother? It's my mother, G2. Mm. Like, my mother cold-blooded. Like, when I say that, my mother had four children. And we had, you know, we had different fathers. When things would get rough with my mother, my brothers and sisters would go live with her mother. Okay. Guess who stayed with the mother? You, of course. Me. We're going to ride it out. We're going to ride it out. Older or younger? Older brother, two younger sisters. So, grow, so then... When did you end up moving? All right, so D.C., Miami, you got to the age where you're in high school now. You stayed in Miami? Uh, no, I'm in mean, D.C. No, I went to elementary, junior high. Uh, I went I went a half a year down here in seventh grade. And I went back to D.C. because me and, my me and my brother was fighting. I pulled a gun on him. And my mother said, hey, yo, man. It's not going to work out. You, you, you got to go. You either going to Chicago or Miami. Going to Chicago, who was in Chicago? Just your family? Uh, That's my, also my mother's side. Okay. Yeah. If you're going to Chicago or you're going to Miami. And what, I'm assuming you, you picked Miami. Of course. So why did you pick Miami, though? I got love down here. That was home. Man, the weather? <laughs> yes. Come on, man. Between Chicago, Chicago and Miami, Chicago is different. Chicago's cold-blooded, man. I ain't like Chicago. To be honest with you, I, I, don't like, I ain't like Chicago. So when you got to Miami, you're a senior, you're, in, you're out of high school now? I'm or? out of high school. You're out of high school, you're in Miami. Coming back home to Miami, because you were still there every summer. Yes. So coming back there full time, you moving in with your grandmother around yes. there? Yes, yes. How was that? I'm going to square up. Like, I can't, listen, check this out. I tell people this, right? Because, you know, both of my children, my daughter's a lawyer. My son is an executive in, in the music business right now, right? I graduated high school on my own because my mother went back to Chicago, when I was 15, I chose to stay with my brother and a family friend and finish high school because I didn't want to go back to Illinois and I didn't want to come to South Florida. I was smart enough and had enough insight that I knew Florida didn't have a good, edu a, a good a educational system. I understood that. Why was education important for you then? I don't know. 
When I look, I, I don't know. I just, listen, I just knew how to get better. And I, at that age, at 15, I was like, all right, I don't want to go back here. It's, you don't know, it's, it's cold there. But I ain't going to Miami because their they, they education system is messed up. And I ain't, I wasn't digging that. I wasn't digging it. And so I told my mother, I'm going to stay in D.C. She said, all right, talk to a friend. You go stay over there. And that's what I did. Had a girlfriend. I used to go spend the weekends at my girlfriend's house. And then I stayed with Miss Ford them up in the attic my last two years of high school. Figured it out. And so oh, what, I was, what I was telling you is that even then I knew I wanted more. Didn't necessarily know how to get it, how to achieve it. Never had a roadmap. Like I tell my children now with all of their, 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 their academic um, proudness now, I never knew anything about SATs or what 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 they call it? SATs, A- A- no A- SATs and ACCs. That's what it is up in, up in DC. Yeah, another one I wouldn't know. I didn't know anything about that to get into college, but I knew I, I wanted to go to college. Like I knew I wanted, but I didn't know these things. I had no one telling me. I was basically raising myself, me and my girlfriend. Wow, oh. you know because you know my father locked up. He right. don't necessarily know about. The, the next level of education. You know, my mother was pretty smart, you know, but my mother was dealing with the issues of my, my grandfather at the time who had cancer and, you know, my grandmother. Life. And her dealing with life. You understand me? With two little girls. And I was just basically on my own. It's like, right, I'm going to come to Miami. So let me tell you what I did. Come to Miami, graduate, I move. As soon as I graduate, I, pew, I'm gone. What to the girlfriend? Shelly stayed around. Okay. She around. <laughs> I just want to know that she came, came to Miami, right? Easiest thing to do is, all right, go and roll in day south. I was a hell of a basketball player. I walked right on the team. We got on the team. Just like that. Mm. My father girlfriend going back there. Cold blood hustler. Still a hustler. <laughs> Woo. She said, go get a job. Got a job. Get in college. Got in college. Went and got a Pell Grant and all that good stuff. Doing pretty good, you know. I'm in pretty good in school, playing basketball. All of a sudden, she said, "Hey, yo, man, we, we, I, you, 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 if you want to get out your grandmother's house, and at the time she was staying with her mother, and she's an older woman, but you know they they stay." She said, "Listen, I'm gonna go get a place. You gotta go get a job." She go get a place, of course, because I'm staying in the I'm staying in the room with my uncles now, mm. right? You telling me I get my own place, man? You gonna get a place? All right, fine. What I gotta do? Stay Just go right. get a job. I go get a job. About three months in, all right, these bills kicking in, right? So I had my little Pell Grant money. Not after three months, yeah, right, that, yeah. that money gone. She said, listen there, player. You got to go get some money. That is. You know what that meant. <laughs> that Stay is. Less. Bruh, man, I dropped out of school. I called my homeboys back up in D.C. I'm hearing, I'm hearing what's going down. I'm in South Florida. Right. All I got to do is call my uncle. They're right down the street. It's a rat. The access is a little different. I started going and getting money, man. 20, 30, 40,000 a week. Changed everything. Everything. At 2021? 20, oh, no, brother. 18. 18. I've been getting money a long time. 18, 19, making 20, 30,000 a week. A week. How do you manage that? I'm just flossing. I don't know. I just, I'm just getting money, man. I'm living. I'm taking care of my sisters. I'm taking care of my mother. I'm definitely on my own, right? The mistake I made, my brother who I'm telling you about that was in Chicago, he in Chicago now. Now we're talking 87. 80s, yeah. 87. So I'm like 19. I got this elaborate operation. I'm in Springfield, Illinois. Mm. Smaller town, but it's in Illinois. Right? Work is going for three times what I'm getting it for. Mm -hmm. Right? I tell my man, I put a scheme together. Listen, every six months we can get a million dollars. I'm telling my brother this. All you got to do is sit in this spot. Just listen. Just sit. We out. We gone. All you got to do, 
Man, I think my brother lasted two weeks. <laughs> he took the whole brother. package. He ran off about 50000 I was going to kill him. And my father, you know, my father's such a G, man. My father, I, I never forget, man, because I was real mad. And at that time, you know, I tell people this right here, and, and people don't understand that, that game or that culture, but my father always told me, you know, he said, man, the dope game is a slimy game and it's a murder game. Facts. And you have to be willing and able at any time to defend that, right? So my 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 brother ran off with that fifty thousand man. I was gonna kill him. I talked to my father. You know my father, son. What's up? I said, man, I'm gonna kill Troy. He said, man, that's your brother. You gotta chalk it up as a loss. He said, in this game, it's gonna be wins and losses. That's your brother. Apparently, he has a habit of don't understand the importance of what you was trying to build with him. But don't take his life over that. When I found him, brother, a week and a half later, you know he was broke? Out of the 50 you left him. Broke. No, the 50 he had made. But that was net profit. Yeah, oh, that was, listen, I was getting that a week. I was getting 25 a week. He lasted two weeks and rolled out because at the time, I'm moving in Miami, D.C., Maryland, and Illinois. I'm moving. Boy, don't I know. Like, I'm moving. Like, it's sweet. I'm 8, 19 years old. Fast. Group of you guys or just you? Dolo. Ooh, even better. I ain't never, even to this day, I don't remember the crew. I got my same friends I've had for the past 40 years. I do business with one guy. That's my cousin. To this day. That's it. Only right. So, you and that process... I'm excited about this. It's going to get good. Because you, when you're doing that type of numbers, at that young, you become an adult pretty quickly, like you're talking about. I mean, I was an adult at 15 when my mother left and gave me the choice to stay. Do you want to stay here? you want to come home with mommy? you want to go with your grandmother? Things, no. things change with 25K a week, though. Man, listen. What happened is, it, you know, what, what happened is you become... You know, at that time, you know, when I look at it, brother... We get in that paper, and all I want to do is look at it, stack up. I didn't necessarily have no direction. It just came so easy. You know, it came like shooting free throws or later. It just feeds the lifestyle at that point. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know, back then, you know, people see me now. You know, I've been driving BMW since 83. I still, I like BMWs today. Like that, that was my lifestyle. I told you, all I, in my life, I've never, only thing I've ever drank in my life it's Hennessy. I drank it warm. Never with ice and never with no chaser. Champagne. That's it. And a beer. A Miller's Light. That's it. That's the only thing I know. So when I come down here, you know, I tell you this crazy story. You know, my wife now today met me, met me in 87. I used to come to Miami, man. I used to go rent cars at Budget and Hertz with no... Mm. With no credit card. I used to stay at the Omni Hotel for months at a time. I used to leave, I used to leave my girlfriend down here, my wife. Now I used to leave her down here in the hotel, go back to DC, drop off to come back down here to go to the beach. Yeah. We were so fly back then, brother, in the wintertime when she was going to have a university, she was coming back with suntans. They were trying to figure out how she getting a suntan and it's cold in DC. The lifestyle was different. Lifestyle was different, bro. That's facts. How, how did she, because it's your wife now, mm -hmm. all the years, what's the secret sauce of how you guys stay together through that whole process? Man, we just believe in one another. She tell me right now the day, you a problem. What a good problem to have. Yeah, facts. So her belief system, believing in you was a game changer. Yeah. Yeah, she 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 super thorough. Super thorough. You know? What makes her thorough? Everything. To put up with a dude like me. And to raise and to produce children that we have. How many children you guys have? Two. 
So you, at, at what age did this? So at 1920, you guys got together. I want to go. And did you guys already start having children that early? My or? first child was born at 22. Did that shift? Did things change oh, for you in that? That now we talking about cold turkey. Everything changed because my run was very short. Because at 22, after two with two weeks after my daughter was born, I was locked up. I was gone for the next year and a half. Is that a blessing? You think more than a blessing? I said I, I I wrote the judge. Man, I got a letter back back in 1989, writing 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 the judge. Man, thanking him. You gotta understand at that time in '89, Washington D.C. was the murder capital of the world. That's when they just started the RICO Act. You know, uh, Jay Javenova used to have this. It was a program it used to come in D.C. It's called City Under Siege. D.C. was 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 vicious in terms of you know drug wars, killings, and stuff like that. So you know, right when that was. Right when that was at its, almost at its apex, I was taken off the streets. Mm. You know, so yeah, I think I think Allah said, "Nah, brother, we, we, we sit your ass down, rethink, regroup, and let me see if you're gonna figure it out." What's the biggest thing you adjusted when you got into prison? Did I adjust it? That you that you had to study and learn and to get you to this point where you are right now. Time. You know when you sitting when, still, you're basically saying, "Man, being still." I think the, I think the Bible talks about that. Sit still, listen, because man, I was moving fast. Like I was moving. You got to understand at that time, right there. I don't think there was no other city. Maybe Detroit. There was no other city that had more young millionaires. Or getting real money in Washington, D.C. Mm. So much so, all, all the dudes out of New York came to D.C. to hustle. Think about that. But, and you in Miami. So you talk about D.C., Miami. You don't think Miami was getting the same? Older dudes was getting money in Miami. I could see, yeah, I, I got it. The older mm. cats, right? And they was, real, they was real bosses and real players, right? They was flashy, but they was kind of low-key. You got to understand, we was young, 17, 18, man. I remember, I remember my boy Lil Mike was 15. He bought an M3 at 15 with no license. This was multiplied 100 times in the D.C. metropolitan area. 13, 14 years old, boys getting that kind of money. Like we had some spots, man. We get 100,000 a night, broke up between me and my partners. On a Friday night, we do 100,000. 17, 18, 19 year olds. Young yeah. boys. Young boys. I was so, listen, we used to be so geek. We used to have these different apartments. We just wanted to fill, we just wanted to fill the floor with money of thousand dollar stacks and see who can, who can, you know, fill the whole floor up. You can't even walk. That was our game. Mm. And mm. I was a connect because my mm. connect was South Florida. Absolutely. So just as well as I can get some conk or snappers here, that's how easy I was able to get my work. Because they they knew me, they trusted me, they loved me, and it, it just my background. Like it was the legacy nothing. that was left for you. Yeah, it was easy. When I tell you easy, it was like <clears throat> it was like coming to my restaurant right now. Let me get a ten piece. What you want, lemon pepper? What you want, honey lemon pepper? I can even give you a twenty piece if you want. I, mean, I get you a quarter, quarter nickels, dimes, halves, holes. I got the same philosophy right now today. That's why my chicken wings are what they call them birds, right? Nickels, dimes, quarters, <laughs> halves. I got the same philosophy I just changed the game You come home A year after What changed for you? Um, my, my daughter was born Right? And I knew And I said Like I said Man I, I, ain't, I, ain't, I ain't want my daughter To come see me in prison And you know what's so dope? I think In that Year and a half time I think my I think Her mother Brought her to see me Only one time in prison but why you didn't want that and your father, you had to go see your father? Because it was her law. And I, I and, and to this day, I never even questioned her or why she didn't bring it. But I understood. But I always, always knew that I was going to get out and I was going to be a changed man. I knew that. I wasn't coming. These squares in here, I wasn't going to be in here no more. I definitely, like... 
you know, some people, and I look at this now, and I look at my city, D.C., right? D.C. had a whole bunch, a whole bunch of more dudes who were way more successful, got way more money than me. Way, I'm talking about, if I was getting 50000 I had some dudes getting probably two and 300000 a week. Mm. Right? But they had crews. Mm-hmm. And you know, with crews bring about different yeah. problems. Absolutely. A whole bunch of envy, jealousy, enmity, all these different things. You know, people get knocked off, killed, whatever. My crew has always been my same crew right now today. Same crew. And we're brothers. We never switch up. So I've never had a, I've never had a, a, a large crew, a large organization. I always, always moved in such a way. It was, it was me and him, my partner. It was me and him. If he ain't got it, I got it. If I ain't got it, he got it. Right? If we couldn't get it, we didn't get it. We sat down and chilled. That was it. So I never had the, 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 the people penetrating the veil to try to get to me to knock me off to get what I want. Right? So I never wanted to be the biggest or the baddest. I just wanted my share. And we was comfortable with our little share. And your little share wasn't little. No, it wasn't little. It was cool. Like, we live, we live good. Probably. Listen, you know what I'm saying? I had spots in Illinois, in Miami, and in D.C. and Maryland. All my spots. And all my little spots was pumping. So when, when, once you adjusted the lifestyle at, when you f- came home, what was next for you coming home? When I, when I, when I, when I came, remember, I, I, spent, I spent a year and a half in a halfway house. No, not a year. I mean, I spent one year. I spent 364 days in a half halfway house. In a halfway house. In is, Miami? No, in D.C. Mm-hmm. I had to be in by 12 o'clock. I can sign out at 6, come back, sign in at 5, sign back out until 12. And then, excuse me, after a month, they would give me a furlough for the weekend where I sign out 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock Friday and I wouldn't have to sign back in to midnight Sunday. But that's where I stayed, Monday through Friday in a halfway house, under supervision, you know, working and everything. And at that time right there, I was in barber school. And then also, you know, my father was a Muslim. My uncles were Muslims, you know. But the, the flip side of that is, you know, on my, on my mother's side and even on my great-grandmother's side, they were all... Baptist ministers, like ministers with churches. So when I was growing up, my father was giving me Islam, and I grew up in a church, and I'm a still lover of the church today. My father and my uncle them was feeding me Islam. So I couldn't decide. I knew and always had the knowledge and the belief of God, right? Always been a believer. But once I became of certain age, and understanding life perils, Islam is what touched me and moved me. And I never forget, you know, I didn't pray to Jesus. I prayed to Allah and I said, Allah, if you allow me to get out of here and raise my daughter, I will make you proud. Right? Right? And that prayer was answered. So even in prison, I didn't even function as a Muslim per se. I studied, but I didn't function as a Muslim. What's the difference? Difference in? In functioning like a Muslim. Okay. Because in prison, you're locked down. You can't do, it's, you're on such a straight and narrow because you don't have the temptations of the world or the free world because you're in prison so you study all day you hang around muslims you read ayats and you know uh quran's and all that that's that's good that's not the test the test is how you're gonna do your islam once you're able out here in these streets can you smoke can you drink can you get high can you go back to the lifestyle that's your test now you put your faith to the test when you have these things that you can't get in prison you can be the best muslim staunch muslim in prison? Nah. Let me see if your faith can carry in the streets where Shaitan is going to try you. Right? So that's why I say I didn't, I didn't 
function, I functioned as a Muslim, but I didn't practice Islam while I was in prison because I knew my test was when I get on these streets. Let me see if my faith holds me over. Right? So when I came, when I, when I, when I, when I came out, ah, here come the test. Let's go. Let's see if you can practice this dean on these streets. Huh. And, 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 and this is where I'm at today. So my success, so I've, so the, so the money I made when I was 18, 19, doing wrong, I'd have made that a hundred times now by being right. So right when you got in, so what did you do? What did you do first? What do you mean? What, what business? What did, how did you activate? You coming home, your life changed, you have a daughter. How did you activate? Uh, first thing I, first thing I, first thing I did, you know, I joined the Nation of Islam. And the first thing they did was put them papers and books in my hand and tapes and said, go to work. So I started selling books and tapes of Minister Farrakhan's speeches. And I was very successful because people always had a liking to me. And I was in fly. In Miami or in no, D.C.? No, in D.C. Right? And once I did that, they recognized my leadership. And if you, if you don't know anything about the Nation of Islam, the Nation of Islam is set up militarily. It's structure. So I became a lieutenant real fast. And then I became a trainer of men. So I would take my men and show them how to get money. Do tapes, do books, do, you know, different, different things. He was already a hustler. That's all I knew. So no matter what product it was, you're going to hustle I'm it. pushing it. I sell, like I tell people, man, I sell sand on the beach right now. I'll go get it. How can you, how can you live in this world and don't want to get no money? How can you satisfy? How can you be satisfied being broke? Yeah, it's a person. I give you a question. Hey, man, how much money you want to make? And I don't know. That's your answer right there. That's why you ain't got it. Ask me the question. It's never enough. It's never enough. Man, you want to meet? Nah, I don't need that much. That's why you ain't got it. That's why you ain't got it. I'm going to keep trying to get it till the, till there ain't no breath left. I'm going to keep trying to get it. And then I'm going to keep trying to inspire. I'm going to keep trying to give knowledge. I'm going to keep trying to be dedicated to a cause, to a people. You understand me? And have discipline to do whatever it takes to win. Like, I'm going to do that. So let's get back to you. So check this out. I'm in a halfway house, right? And if anybody know about prison or penitentiary, the bottom bunk is usually for those of seniority. So I'm laying in the bottom bunk, halfway house. I see this big guy come in, about 400 pounds, right? Got to get on top of my bunk. So you know me. I know the prison rules. That's just what it is. But still, it's something about me. First thing I did, I checked him out. He had some gaiters on. He had some nice corduroys on. He had a Kooji sweat on. And if anybody know anything about D.C., ain't nobody flyer than us. I say, whoa. This dude must be somebody. He, he fly with it. And he in a halfway house. I'm like, this nigga doing it in a halfway house. Right. Well, and he's old, the old man. Oh, he's an older dude. So the second day he come in, I see him come in again. He's struggling. I'm telling you, Hank, about 400 pounds. Brother, listen, take this bottom bump. Mm, the game. I go up top. He watched me. He said, young fella, what you doing? I said, man, I'm just out. I'm just, you know, trying to figure it out. He said, uh, come see me. Come see me where? I'm here with you. Yeah. He said, nah, man, come on, H, come on, H and H. This is this is Northeast DC. Come to find out. He was in jail for child support. But he had ran one of the biggest black suppliers to D.C. government. His man was Marion Barry and the brother by the name of Ivanhoe Donaldson. So he secured all the procurement for disposable and paper products for the whole D.C. government. Mm. He took a liking to me and man, put me on game. That's how, I, that's how I'm so now involved in politics because I, he taught me that game. 
He taught me how to go get these contracts, how to deal with these politicians, how to maneuver. I worked for him about a good, yeah, good year and a half. But in the midst of that, I went to, I was in barber school too. Because by trade, I'm a barber. So I was in barber school, in a halfway house, just joined the Nation of Islam and working. So you 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 finding a way to hustle by all means. Getting it. Getting it. And then I would start, I start traveling with the minister. I'm a young boy. I only supposed to leave DC. I only supposed to leave DC. But I'm so enthralled and so I'm so I'm just so with it. And I started, man, wherever where the minister, Minister Farrakhan was speaking, I was there selling stuff. That's why I was, you know, tens of thousands of people there. Go give me some money. You already knew to be there. What? And they already like me. I'm a lieutenant. So I'm moving now with soldiers. So I take my soldiers. We gone. We bag up. Same work. Same D work. Different work, same strategy. A righteous, you know, righteous cause. And understanding the dilemma of the black man and woman in the hells of North America. And now I got a conscience mm. to resurrect the mentally deaf, dumb, and blind. So I just stopped moving. I start moving hell of hellified, man. When did you when you transition to Florida? Uh 92. One child still, or by then you have two. I got one. Still got my daughter. Still got my daughter. Your wife was still in college or she She was out. Out. So now your wife graduated from school. You have one daughter. You're building stability in the family. You decide I'm going back down to Miami. I had a little money still left. Of course you did. I never questioned that. We moved to Miami. The reason why I moved to Miami, dudes are still wearing jerry curls in Miami. Jeez. I said, I'm coming to Miami. I'm, I'm going to put this Quiet. barber game real fly. I'm going to be fly with You opened a barbershop. I worked, listen, I worked at a barbershop for four months. I used to cut nothing but Hispanics hair. Back then, I, I, at least I, I didn't know too many Hispanics that came to black barbershops. Right. But I was so fly with it, I attracted them. Within six months, brother, I moved to Coconut Grove and got up, opened my own shop. And you know what that name of that shop is, right? You don't know? What's the number one promotional company in the world? It's Headliners. Where do you think Headliner Market Group came from? It came from Headliners Barbershop. Why? Because that's all we deal with is nothing but the best. We, we, we are not the opening act. We are the act. That's where Headliners came from. For those that don't know Headliners Marketing Group, explain what that is. Headliners Marketing Group is, you know, when you, when you think of longevity, success, and if you ever think about the number one club in the world, people are going to say, oh, Studio 54. The biggest, baddest club ever. What we've created, live on Sunday for the last 13 years, is by far, bar none, the number one grossing club in the world and the longest run standing. What did you guys bring to that? You know, first of all, they wouldn't let, for y'all who listen on this, they wouldn't let black folks stay on Miami Beach, black folks can only work on Miami Beach. Fountain Blue was no different, even though Sammy Davis Jr. and Frank Sinatra were regulars there. They had to go over town to live and to perform. And the Fountain Blue, as famous as it, as it is, you know, had went through like everything in Miami. Miami Beach was decaying, rotten, falling apart. And when they redid uh, the Fountain Blue, and I think the Arabs invested, boys from Saudi invested a bunch of money. They put a bunch of money into the Fountain Blue. But Fountain Blue was not producing no revenue. And we was doing a party, or my cousin was doing a party at this place called The Forge. Another Who's iconic. Your cousin? What's the cousin? His name is Mike Gardner. Mike Gardner is your cousin. That's my cousin. And Mike Gardner is the reason, I am the reason why Mike Gardner came 
to Miami, the University of Miami, to play basketball. So this plan has been hatched, man, brother, since, believe it or not, and now that I think about it as I'm talking to you, when I was in the halfway house, Mike was being recruited by almost all the colleges, basketball. And I told him, I said, Mike, because I knew Miami. I knew it was a bunch of money here. I said, Mike, go to University of Miami. I say, listen, I got to do another year in the halfway house. But as soon as I get out, I'm coming to Miami. When I come to Miami, I'm going to show you how to get some money. Hmm. And that's what happened. Anyway, Mike came down, basketball, got kicked off the team. Wound up going to Nebraska, Oklahoma, somewhere, but wound up finishing at DePaul. And at this time right here, I came to Miami in 92. Yeah, 92. I think Mike graduated from high school in 91. So he did a year. I came down here in 92. He balling. I opened up Headliners Barbershop. And in the midst of Headliners Barbershop, my barbershop became the go-to place where every Heat player, every Dolphin player, every Hurricane player was at my barbershop. So I know all of them. The Warren Saps, the Michael Burroughs, the, you know, uh, Lamar Thomas. All these dudes came the to my shop. The location was key to... Yeah, I'm in Coconut Grove, which is close Union. proximity to um, University of Miami. Mike get kicks off the team. He leaves. But I'm heavy in the nation now. Like, I'm moving now. I'm a regional captain. So now I'm moving men throughout the state of Florida, throughout uh, South and Central America and the Caribbean. All of these men are under my charge. So I got an army. But I'm moving righteously, right? So Mike graduates, come back to Miami. And at the time right there, he has a marketing degree. I say, cuz, listen, man, we need to own, I want to open up a chain of barbershops. He got a marketing degree. We know everybody. Come on, man, let's do it. Well, it never, it never panned out. And Mike used to party all the time. And I sat him down with this Islam I got. I said, listen, man, we don't party. Get more serious about your life. We got everybody from Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Patrick Ewing, everybody who's somebody come in my barbershop. I touch him like I'm touching you. Right? My cut, Mike is a great basketball player, so he knows all the ball players. I say, listen, we have to stop. You got to stop partying. Let's figure out a way of how to monetize our relationships to do these events in Miami. And that's how Headline and Marketing was born, because of our relationships. Right? Fast forward, we had a bunch of L's, like a rack of L's. Mm. I know the feeling. So when 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 the Fountain Blue was going bankrupt, after they got this big loan, they wouldn't get no money. The forge had just closed. Cuban boy came who knew my cousin. And we want to give you a night. We, 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 we think we want to do the urban crowd. Because usually what happened is when these white clubs or establishments are about to go under, now they want to bring blacks sure. in. Bring an influx of cash quick. That's what they did. So the Cuban guy was managing the club? He was a partner. He was a partner with um, Dave Grutman. Mm -hmm. Well, Mike is a promoter. Mm -hmm. I'm just a businessman. I'm the consigliere to him. Right? I'm telling him, yo, player, stop partying. You got to make some money. Stop Stand in the back of the barbershop with this bullshit. Let's go start partying. If you like to party, let's make some money off of it. And that's where HMG was born. But fast forward, after these, you know, after these, you know, few few hits that we had, and we had some success, but few hits that we had. I'm always playing the background. Um, the for, the the fountain blue thing came up. And, you know. White boys came in and they wanted to try to do it their way. They want to regulate. Y'all already, y'all ain't successful. Shut up. This don't work. It don't work. Let us rock. 13 years later. But right. now, just the start of it, because you were in Miami 2000, 2005. What do you mean? Like, the starting live on Sundays. 2000, 2012. no, not 9, 2010. 2009, 2009. 
That's right when remember 08, 09 was a financial crunch again. People lost a lot of money. It was it was fucked up. And they had just started. That's what happened. They had just started. It was losing money. It was losing money. So they need to activate what? cash and now. They tried to give us a Thursday. Now nah, we want a Thursday because we was doing crew on Y. We ain't going to get y'all no Friday. We ain't giving y'all no Saturday either. Arrogance. I ain't giving y'all that. Fuck it. We'll go to church on Sunday. Let's go. What man? The moment you guys decided to go on Sunday, what made you guys pick that Sunday? Because we used to do, Mike and my cousin, Louis Oliver, was doing Soul Food Sundays at Forge anyway. And that closed down. So you guys already had a group, a relationship with yeah, a crowd but this, on Sunday. Yeah, but there was a small group, 200 people. Strong, consistent. But, but small, but it was it was cool. Live, live can hold, what, 1,500 people. And live is massive. Like you walk and live, you like you walking into giant stadium. Right. You understand me? We're going to do church on Sunday. And we fought with them about for four weeks. They was trying to control. Control but, the crowd, how they come yeah, in, just, how yeah, they work. All, all that. But Mike is such a marketing genius and he can touch everybody. And once they wrangled, they gave him that little bit of control. And I was able to just run the front door the way I needed to because they was doing that. Oh, you can get in. You can't get in. You can get in. You can't get in. Ah, man, that shit is old. Like, y'all not great. Do the same shit they was doing in the 50s. We're going to let our people in. Changed everything. Hey, man. Half a billion dollars later. When you guys knew you had something? Shit. Within, within six months. Nine months. Nine months. Nine months. It was out of here. What changed? Two years. I just, Mike is a marketing genius. I can't tell you his formula because he he knows stuff that I don't know, but he's like, he just put it together. And it, it was timing. It was uh, relationships. space, relationships. It was commandeering our culture and regulating it and putting that, putting that black stamp on it. When did the club started understanding you guys have something? Nine months, six months, six to nine months in. Now they just falling back, letting you guys run your show. Slim. <laughs> the shit that David Grut Grutman has built off of Live on Sunday is unmatched. Yes, it's unmatched. Now, he's been a fair partner to Mike, which is my cousin. And he understands and respects Mike. Right? So I have nothing bad to say about him because in that industry, it's a very it's a it's a it's a slimy game. I've been on it for 20 years. You understand me? It's a slimy game. But one thing I can say about him, he's been very fair and upfront with my cousin and, and letting my cousin do what he do. Do you guys believe the partnership of Live on Sundays with owner and club promoter, whatever title you want, a relationship, do you guys believe if you guys had full right and ownership of the whole thing would change? Or did they bring their value? Of course it will. That's what, that's what I'm telling you. Dave and the Fountain Blue have been solid partners. It's very difficult in this industry. Man, listen. They have been solid partners. Honestly, I can say that unequivocally. Just They have been Mike... You run it. You tell us what you want. We're going to back you. And that's what I mean by solid partners. And, and they've done it. And that form, like this, 13 years later, you can't argue with success. You cannot argue with success. 13 years later. There's no other club in history that has a run Thanks. like live. No other club in history 
You can talk about Studio 54. Studio 54 is the pack jam compared to what Live on Sunday is. Studio 54 was doing $3 million a year. We did a million dollars in one night. Multiple times. Studio 54 did $3 million a year at their height. We did a million dollars multiple times in one night in five hours. What makes a million dollar in one night in a club? $40,000, $50,000 tables. That's, what does that forty fifty thousand dollar $50,000 table gives you in that space? It gives you a whole bunch of fun, I guess. It's a lifestyle. Come on, man. You got, you got, they got Jeroboam champagne bottles that cost 175000 You know, they come out in wheelbarrows. 40 people bringing them out with a light show. Who's buying that bottle? Yeah, it's, a, it's a couple of them. They do it. Corporate execs, every. Bruh. Bruh. I seen, I've seen, what's the running back from, uh, uh, what's the little brother from um, the fast? I think, I think he played with Tennessee. Running back. Fast dude. He's had a little dreads in his head. Running back. I think he played for Tennessee. I've seen him come in and spend 100000 cash. Let me get that. Let's go. Mark Cuban spent 300000 when they won the championship. When do you guys know you have a million dollar night? How does that how does that look like? Meaning it's, it's, doors, crazy. Every- We've done it so many times now, man. It's regular. It's regular. That's regular. What indications are you seeing when it looks like a million dollar? Because I've had ups when, and downs in when, this industry. When people are, when people are paying two thousand dollars just for an entrance. I remember. For entrance. No tables. No bottles. For entrance. And there's a line for that. Slim. You can't even let people in. Like, you got to stop. You Listen, we can let 10. You got to let 100 out to let one in. When you walk into live, it's like walking into probably Lambeau Field. Alabama, uh, the college shit. When you walk in and live, when you talk about when it when it gets like that, bruh, that's how it feels. You walk and live, you gotta understand that you got a 40, 50 foot ceiling. You come to them big old steps and you get right there and you look down and you see all them people. Come on, man. So one thing I know from being a, an event promoter and doing it and owning clubs in this business, when you get that chance to look at Mike. And you see them numbers, that feeling you guys get. When did you guys ever have, like, when did, was it the first million dollar night where you guys look at each other and say, we got something with this one? Or was it after the six months happened? You know, brother, the the real shit is, it's about the money, but it ain't about the money. Mm. It's about creating an atmosphere. I mean, you know what it's like to, you know what it's like to go see, you know, to see LeBron James play or to see Magic play. Like, that's a feeling, man. You remember that. After that, you just see, you just witness the greatness. Even if it's not about, like, I get it. It's not about the money. That feeling, that atmosphere. That feeling you get once you know you're winning. The atmosphere, the culture, the people, the right person at the door. Have you and Mike ever had the moment to just stop and look at each other in the middle of that and say, man, we got something? Me and Mike has never had that conversation, to be honest with you. Mike is, Mike is, Mike is, Mike is more humble, humbler than me. I got money earlier than Mike. And I got mine the hard way. So me and I was in shit when I encountered it when I was 18. Mm. You understand me? So that don't move me. What moves me is the people. And and the and the and the 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 excitement that they see 
that we created it. And we and we just we, we just some black men. Whereas at the time, like I said, you couldn't even be on the beach after seven o'clock without a pass. And now we've we've created this this this, this movie. brand, this identity, this everything. Man. It's, it's everything. That's that's live on Sundays. That's more so. precious than any money. Facts. That's real. You know what I mean? Money is gonna come. But hell, you know, we I look at it like, man, let's listen. This is what we're supposed to be doing because of our greatness. How did you get into the food and beverage business? Well, how you convert? Was that in the same time? Nah, brother. That's just that's just I get listen. I told you I started Headliners Barbershop. Mm-hmm. And I've cut everybody here. Denzel Washington, Patrick Ewing, Scotty Pippen, Biggie Smalls, Puffy. I've cut all of them guys' hair. They've been in my shop. And I talked to them just like this. At a time, I think I was probably doing, I probably was making about 200000 a year, right? There's a difference between 200000 cash and 200000 earn. on earn. You understand me? So it looked like I was probably getting another million. That million 100%. has been that million has always been in my, in, my, in my bloodline. You understand me? I know we keep talking about a million, but I'm just letting you know a million is a million, right? So I got bored. I'd done everything. I've cut everybody. I've been on the sets of bad boys. Like I've I've did I was burnt. I was I ain't gonna say I was burnt out, but I was like, man, like I'm bored. I get it. Then I, I, you know, I had a bunch of dudes who went on to open up shops to model minds, replicate. And, uh, but me, me and my partner, me and Terry, uh, we should love wings. Fuck it, I'm going I'm I'm to open up a wing joint. Because there's only one, it was one wing, it was a wing spot down south in Cutler Ridge. And it was one wing spot, used to be up here, I think on Oakland or somewhere called Wings and Things. or somewhere, Oakland, commercial. It was a big wing spot. It's like ah, I can I can do better, right? So I was practicing in the kitchen. I'm like, well, I'm gonna do this. I said, man, I gotta come up with a way. So my thing was back then. You remember, you only had maybe four or five flavors. We're talking twenty some years ago. Four or five flavors of wings. I said, man, I want to be the Baskin Robbins of wings. Mm. Thirty one flavors. So I started experimenting with different flavors, right? So Tim Hardaway, partner of mine, client in the barbershop. Tim. Basketball player Tim Hardaway. That's my man. Mm-hmm. Tim. I need 35000 I want to open up a wing joint. You be my partner. Tim gave me 35000 I gave him 75000 in 30 days. That's how much money I made off selling wings. So you back on again. I'm out of here. I don't even want to tell you them numbers. You got to understand, when I was the only game in town. And over the same location? No, I was in Coconut Grove, Coconut where my barbershop Grove. started at. Oh my God. So you started. already have the relationships. Same thing. Next. My barbershop was right next to my wing shop. Jesus Christ. That formula is exciting. Yeah, so it's a match made in heaven. So then I did that. You know, I got real adventurous. Cause I went to at that time right there. That's when um, what well, it was called ESPN Zones, I think. You, you ever heard of ESPN Probably. Zones? I went down south. Only black person on US one. Six thousand square feet. I built a joint, man. Pool tables, TVs in every booth. Crazy. I spent crazy money. That was around 07, 06, 07, something like that. After four years, four years, I was, four years, I, that's when I went and got this big location. Open it up. And that was right, right around that time, 07, I think. Uh, yeah, because 08, 09 is when the financial crash happened again, right? And I pumped like a million dollars in that junk, man. I lost it in two years. What makes you think you, why you think that happened? Um, Lack of planning, using my own funding. Um, the market was bad. Didn't know how to adjust to, and we just went through this again, but I, I, I handled it very well. At that time right there, everything doubled on me. Like I used to get a case of chicken for $35. Wow. 
Back then, I think 08, 09, it went up to like $90. Right? So my overhead was very large. Remember, I'm on US 1. I'm competing with Burger King, Pollo Chopper Cal, Denny's. I'm competing. You know, I'm just a dude with, you know, just a little bit of money and ambition. Not understanding really the tally. Listen, man, you need to have a million dollars over here just to float you over something happen. I'm hustling. I'm give me another brick. I'm going to turn it. Same scenario. But it don't, it don't work. It doesn't Let's work the that. same. You see what I'm saying? So I close it, but I'm going to tell you what I did. I had my first food truck in 08 because I already knew where it was going. I knew I was going to lose this. Fuck it. I don't need a brick and mortar. I'm going to give me a food truck. I remember food trucks didn't catch on in 2009, 2010. That's when shit started, you know. But I was already ahead of the game. So I was surviving because I still had you my location. Close and close I, Spring, no, Coconut and Grove, I'm still open. Grove. Uh, down south, which is like in the Color Ridge area, I closed that. But I had the food truck that I was pumping on the weekends. And then uh, from there, that's when I got, I signed, matter of fact, I signed, I had three locations in 07. Overtown, Coconut Grove, down south. I closed down south. And then I closed Coconut Grove in... 2009, 2010, but I already had signed a lease for Overtown, but I didn't open that until 2011. In that midst of building all this stuff, I, w- I got to ask this question. How was your wife functioning in all this? She a trooper. I told you. She a trooper. She just know to go with everything you're doing. Oh, man. She believed in me. Her believing in you, what do you think that did for you? I mean, that's a support system out of this world. Cause you can have you can have you can have a woman who's only with you for the glory and not with you for, you know, for the for the end game, who can be distracted, who can be taken off base by easily, you know, frustration with the man and his pitfalls, or man with his died dreams, a man that hasn't reached a level, his, his level of success yet. She can be short-sighted. Or she can see, she can see through all of that bullshit and the good within you and the believe in you to make you go. But she gotta be thorough. What I mean thorough is if 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 she needs to carry you, she can. And that's mentally, physically, financially, spiritually. She has to be on all, all accord. And she's like that. Raising the kids in that environment, why did college, executive position, law, how did you, like, what, why did they go that route, your children? Because, you know, my wife comes from a, a very strong educational background. Schooling is a must, right? So they didn't they didn't have any choice, right? Mix that with a revolutionary mind like me is a hell of a plus. You understand me? And I ain't never been no slouch. You know? She met me, I was getting money the wrong way. Then took my dream and turned it the right way. Had my ups and downs, but she knew. Slim ain't going to stay broke for long. And he ain't going to settle. He going to go get it. And the good thing is, he ain't going back to the streets. You understand me? That probably, and I just thought about that as you told me. With that contract, she understood, let me support him all the way. Because he ain't going to risk it all to do no dumb shit just to get over. He's going to figure out a way how to survive and how to get us through. So you think that standard in your home was formed between the both of you guys, but the standard of education, the standard of hustling, the standard of going to create something for yourself is is the foundation of your family? Yes. Yes. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Period. As, listen, my children have followed a course that is crazy. When I say crazy, meaning 
My daughter went to boarding school, sent to the boarding school at 13, speaks Spanish and Arabic fluently, right? Mm. Left school, you know, left the house at 13, been to school in Turkey, been to school in Uruguay, been to school in South Africa, well-traveled, right? I wanted her to be a doctor. She had all her prerequisites done until her junior year because she was going to be a doctor. Why? Because I knew that medicine is what we need in our community best. Had a little slip up, got out of the program, but finished. She wanted to, once she, once she graduated, she wanted to go get her master's. Her mother said, no, that's average. You're going to law school. Right? She applied, well, she took her LSAT, didn't have the right scores, didn't get the right schools. Uh, she got plugged in. She started working for the Obama administration. She was assistant to Secretary of Transportation the whole term of Obama. Finally got accepted to the right school, finished law school, top of her class. Got one of the most pre prestigious, probably with one of the most prestigious law firms in Boston, understood the program. I'm going to learn this business and then I'm moving on. Mergers and acquisitions. She's been doing that now for five years. And now she's saying, daddy, I want to come work for you. With all the things you got going on. It's how much money I need. I think you can afford me. Let me finish this, this thing out. And I'm coming home to work for you. That feeling. Ah. My son. I'm giving him money to start different, different, different businesses. He went to Howard. He's another Howard. All I'm, all I went to Howard. Wife, daughter, son. All I went to Howard University. Beautiful. You know, H, you know, H U. <laughs> I paid him a lot of money. Um, <laughs> they like you. Cause they ain't in no scholarships. I pay, I paid him a lot of money, man. Right. Uh, uh, so my son had three or four different endeavors. I backed him. Ain't made no money, but that's my son. Only I, right. I give it to him again. He want to get into the music industry. I say, son, I don't like that shit. <laughs> he defied me. Uh, he worked for Queen Latifah and them for two and a half, three years. Ain't really going nowhere, but, you know, got a lot of contacts. Um, COVID happened. Uh, my daughter with these, with, with her amazing contacts, uh, made a call, started working for Apple for a minute. Your son or your daughter? My son. Started working for Apple, started a record label. Uh, then my, my daughter made another call through these relationships. Uh, so now he, one of the executives at Spotify at 25. So he's curating all this playlist shit that you see. And don't nobody even know it. But he's a sharp young man. Like he's super, super sharp, talented, bright, where, you know, he got, a, he got executives now that's trying to lure him away to come over to these record companies. Cause he got an eye for talent and music and you know, that's, that's just his shit. And I try to give him, listen, I try to give him, yo son, come home. I got a restaurant. I want to give you. Nah, I'm good. But his, his dad and his uncle, Mike have been dealing with the industry for a hundred years. That's it. That's his it. sister goes off the relationship. <laughs> this is his, this is them. Yeah. Yeah. Now he's at Spotify doing his own thing, yep. creating his own impact. Yep. This is getting real interesting. Yeah. Now he's he's dope. He's a dope little dude. Like I said, I said, yo, I got a restaurant for you. Got a building. I bought it. It's paid for. Let's go. Come do a house of wings. I'm good. But I think I could. I'm good. I'm excited for him because now he's getting into the back end of what's actually happening in the industry. Yeah. And he's seen it with Spotify. Yeah. No, no. He he. I'm telling you, he created a platform, uh, like Square or this other shit. Six years ago, he had that. He was doing it on his own thing. Like, we do, it, we did events. We would go events. We come to our events. It was his company that was doing the pay shit. 
Like he had a whole system six years ago. And I tell you, he a thousand times smarter than me. Whatever this shit, event bright and all that, he had his own shit six years ago. But we was getting our own money from my events off his swipe. So he's you talk about live all the when you guys are doing not live, no, we, not so live, any events, but any any other events that we was doing outside of that. Because you, you know we did other his events. Program. His program. Let's go. It's beautiful. Like he was crazy on that six years ago at 21. Do you believe your kids know how to activate access and relationships? My daughter does. When I call before I tell her, hey, when you coming home, let me sit down and talk to you. Because I listen, for me, I can hear it and I can go. She's detailed. She has What's that lawyer, name? that trained mind that merges and acquisitions. She know how it should look. What does she say? Da 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 da. Cause she does that all day, every day. She knows how to, you know what I'm saying? She knows how to calculate, formulate, da da, all that shit. She knows that. When we're talking legacy, what does that look like for you with the children you have? I'll just be successful and be happy. I don't know. I mean, I don't. You know, I just want. I just want. I just want them to be proud. Of their parents. Proud of that name. Be people of integrity. And always have a heart for humanity. You know what I mean? Like, on some real shit. Like, be thoughtful and genuine with people. Right? But be bold and vicious if necessary. Like, I, I live on that. Like, I live on that. Humble as a dove. But don't, don't cross me. Don't get a twister. Yeah. Just, just don't cross me. It's better for you to put it out there and say, hey, we ain't doing it this way. All right, I respect that. But don't be manipulative or conniving, any of that, because then... You know, you never know what the outcome may be. And for you, you may think it's a game. For someone else, it's legacy. It's protection of my name. It's protection of my reputation. That they take it that serious. You know? So, you know, that, that's, that's how I see it. What does the future look like? What I mean by that is, because it sounds like your daughter... Is telling you what's what's moving next. I mean, I'm coming to work for my father, and taking the businesses to another capacity. I'm assuming, mm-hmm. you know, I'm assuming. Um, what does that look like for you for the next couple years? Are you slowing down? Are you gonna no. activate a little bit, man? More? I, man, listen, man, I'm still doing 100 straight push-ups, man. I'm still going on four hours of sleep. I'm still traveling around oh, the world, Lord. man. I still want to give me some money. I ain't counting enough money yet. My bank accounts, I can still read it. Ah, come on, man. Uh, my next move is to develop these black neighborhoods into skylines with housing, infrastructure, doing things like this, you know, giving us opportunities the otherwise we've been cut out of. As small as it may be, I understand I don't need the whole pie. Give me a slice of the pie. And every slice is going to equal to a whole one day. So that's my thing. That's my thing. That's my legacy. You know, that's what I'm doing. You know, man, I just, you know, I just, we just want to be black and bold. That's it. What does Overtown mean to you? Man, over, Overtown, you know, I was thinking about this, man. Like, we have, we have changed the paradigm to Overtown in these last 10 years. And it's been a slow, beautiful process. And the only thing that it don't worry me to the point where I'm going to be losing sleep over it, but we still as black people have not understood the importance of our identity and culture. And we still, we, we don't want to control it. 
Is it that we don't know how? Nah, we get we got the bright we got the bright the brightest and some of the best. We are afraid of ruffling other people's feathers. We are afraid to be bold and bodacious and ferocious with it. We have we have taken a posture of that we must be in, uh, inclusive opposed to exclusive. Because when you allow certain individuals or certain mindsets into your ram and they don't understand the order, the power structure that goes, they will swallow you up and take you over and throw you out. So you got to be a vanguard in your community. That is one of the reasons why when I came into Overtown, I started purchasing land because I'm a land owner. I'm not a renter. I'm not a leaser. I'm an owner. Right? And all my shit is paid off. So when you talk about a free black man, I'm a free black man. That's why I can talk the shit that I talk. A lot of people can't do that. Because they got a bunch of entities that they want to they wanna protect or it's maybe not politically correct or it's, you know, they're going to cut their bag off. We are the culture in everything. We are the culture. The only thing we're not the culture in is financial institutions. But we even own that if we take these athletes and use them as financial institutions and they understand the language, we can bank our own selves. Think about that. You don't need no bank. When I go get hard money, it's a group of it's a group of guys, three or four of them, say, all right, how much you need? All right. We're gonna get at eight, nine percent. We're gonna get 18 months, 24 months. Gonna, you know, it's how we make our money. That's how they do it. We collectively haven't got a group of Steph Curry's, LeBron James, well, LeBron and Steph may be doing it. But just just take a few of the athletes. 50 million a year? You, you, you signed a $251 million contract? So you mean to tell me you can't, five of y'all can't take $250 million, put it in a bank, make some interest off of it, create businesses or create loans or, excuse me, financial institutions to lend to good things to keep it going. All you can do is go lease some cars and buy some jewelry and finance some homes and keep your side chicks on the side? Stop it. Unfortunately, that's what we are. Right? But yeah, you, you can have somebody like Jerry Jones put up a lot of his money and then go borrow the other part. And now he's making money off the stadium. And he ain't use even all his money. He using institutions. And then you got cowboy fans like me who supporting the shit. <laughs> they paying for it. We paying for it. And he living. <sighs> he can go anywhere in the world and get a $10 billion loan. We worth 500 million. We can't even get a million dollar loan. They're going to make us jump through the hoops, pay high interest rates, or have a slick ass accountant with a pen going to rob us. If, if it's going to be 10%, he's going to charge us 23%. He's going to make 13% to take his family. And the 10% go back to the other institution, which is his friend, and ain't going to say nothing. And nigga, you broke. That's how cold blooded it is, brother. What do you think Overtown needs to go to another capacity? It's coming. Overtown is Overtown is done. Here? Overtown mm. is done. Overtown is done. There's 13 different high rises about to go Overtown in the next 24 months. So it's going to go from if it was 7,000 people over there, 25,000 people. 95 percent probably white Hispanics. Done. Mm. Done. Already. You got to remember, Overtown is five minutes from the arena, five minutes from downtown, 11 minutes from the airport, eight minutes to Miami Beach, 12 minutes to the design district or Midtown. Mm. That's Overtown. What do I look like living out in Weston or all these other places? I got to go 45 minutes to come over here. When your access is... Same thing with Liberty City. Same thing with Liberty City. 
I've been telling people for the last five, six, seven years, buy Liberty City, buy Liberty City, buy Liberty City. Because then it was cheaper. Now it was, you got homes in Liberty City. I'm going for 400,000. Four years ago, you can get them for 60. 60,000. And understand, this is the game. When our parents bought houses in the 50s or the 60s, right? And if we were smart enough, those same houses sent our children, sent their children to college, came home, say their parents died. Oh, I'm living in Pembroke Pines now. Oh, I'm living in Fort Lauderdale. They didn't understand that house was a bank. That same house they paid 30000 for is now worth 450000 You could leverage that to go do other things, but no, you sold it. Or as siblings, you start fighting over it because, you know, this one ain't paying the taxes, da, da, da. Man, just give me 10000 so now you wind up selling the house for 100000 because somebody came to you with 100000 in cash. Now they didn't flipped it and brought their other family, and now you change the demographics in that neighborhood. So that neighborhood is not what it was when you grew up. Because we didn't understand that house was a bank to give us leverage to access capital. But then these lending institutions still don't lend to us today. So that's what I'm telling you about our resources are our black athletes and entertainers if we only knew how to leverage those relationships, how to leverage these institutions, how to leverage your windfall of cash and create opportunities to control our culture and our own destiny. But we don't see that picture. That's why we're lagging so far behind. My brother... The wisdom you have is going to impact a lot of people. Hey, man, I'm here. I I, I just I want to say definitely thank you for coming up because you came all over from Miami. That's to, right. To bless us. That's right. With the presence. But we have some other business that we have to. Facts. Develop that we're going to. I'm on that. I, I say less. I'm I, on that. I, I already know. Well, my eyes is turning. You told me. What? Yes. What? In real time. This is what you need? Yes. Is this what we can do? Yes. And like I told you, I'm not ashamed to say I may not know the particulars. But you have the sense. You're a hustler. Yeah. Hustler know what time it is. Yeah. That's why I don't bring it to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Like, yo. One plus one equals two pretty yeah. quickly here. Yeah. Let's go. This, this, what, what bro? Oh, I got this. Yeah. Let's see how we can make this happen. It, and it's gonna happen pretty quickly, but I think there's some there's some other things that I know we're gonna do well together with that I'm I study over town. When you breaking down what you breaking down and the influx of people that's coming in pretty quickly, mm -hmm. they need access to things. They they wanna eat a certain thing, they wanna drink. Like it's it's a whole community, but that's just not here. I think some of the things that I have that I'm gonna present to you and speak with you about, there is a lot of different next level business models okay. that yeah. we could activate and, and multiply in multiple cities and communities. So, I'm with it. So I know you're with it, man. Good brother, man. Brother Musadiq, man, I appreciate you. I appreciate you, brother, having you, me. You you gave real game. You talked about the hustle. You talked about the process. I can't wait to do another series of this because I think I want to do something else with you. Okay. I believe your impact, your knowledge you're able to speak the language. You're able to communicate with a group of people that never understood success in your capacity and to be who you are. That's a very unique thing. Because I wish when I was growing up, I had the same upbringing where I was raised by hustlers, people that knew how to figure it out and they mm -hmm. found a way. But I think your level of success and what we've produced in our hardship, ups and down from support system to... So many things, man. I believe brothers like yourself could impact so much more. They just need to meet you. They That's what it's about. Connect with you. That's what it's about. And platforms like this is why I created this. Because somebody's going to hear this and be like, wait, this brother went through all this hardship and is still winning in this capacity? And now he understands. Like, I never understood politicians. Mm. I didn't even know what the heck it was. Now I interviewed, now I had a conversation with a state senator that talked about the process. Where we grow up from in the hardship in the streets, they need to meet brothers mm -hmm. like you that adjusted. Mm -hmm. Still hustling. Mm -hmm. We just adjusted hustle. Right. So I think I, I know for sure there's going to be a lot more to come. And I want to close out, my brother. Thank you. Appreciate you. A lot more to come. And I can't wait Appreciate to meet the, the, the original OGs you built. <laughs> God bless. Good night. Yes, sir. Good night.
Thank you, man.